webinar will be led by our Google Apps for Certified trainer, Greg, and he's going to do a part two of a webinar that he actually started two weeks ago on digital science mm. notebooks with Google Apps. And today's webinar is being recorded, so you'll be able to access this video as well as Greg's slides and his um, and the question and answer transcript that will happen throughout the webinar uh, later this week. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please ask it in the Q&A box. That's the one with the white box with the question mark inside. That way everybody can see the question, and when we answer it, everybody can see the answer to that. So I'll try and answer some of those questions throughout the webinar and, and ask Greg ones that are specific to his content, but we'll also have time at the end to answer any questions that you might have. So head up, Greg. Thanks, Dana. Um, again, I'm Greg Benedict Grab, and I'm going to be doing part two of Digital Science Notebooks. Uh, last time I gave kind of an overview of the philosophy of the notebooks, and this time I'm going to go to some more, more of the details of how I implement it. Um, so this is Digital Science Notebooks part two. Um, let me show you, let me just quickly show you who I am. Um, I'm a Google Apps um, for Education certified trainer. Um, I work at the school at Columbia, and I've been teaching science for about 14 years. Um, and just to recap, if you weren't here for um, Digital Science Notebooks Part 1, um, this is about an experiment that I did in my classroom where I went from a paper science notebook to a digital science notebook um, using Google Apps. Um, and I kind of wanted to see what, what the advantages and disadvantages were. And this um, webinar is a chance to kind of reflect on that and show you some of the things that I've done. I did last year, and I'm continuing um, in the experiment for this year. Um, just to uh, get on what why I chose digital science notebooks, I, I feel like access um, for students is a big deal, um, both in the classroom having access, meaning a lot of people can access documents at the same time, but also inside and outside of school access. Um, collaboration is a big focus um, for the notebooks, and so there's a lot of emphasis on students working together. Um, it's important to me that the Google interface is very intuitive, so there's not a lot of time spent on training. The kids kind of can get into it right away, and it helps make my um, learn space more learner-centered, and there's a lot of opportunities for students to take a leadership role um, using technology um, as a vehicle for that. Um, so before we get, I get deeper into the presentation, um, I'm going to use a tool I used last time. I'm going to have you fill out a form, and you can actually have access to the resources as, as we're going. So you can both view the webinar, but you can also um, go ahead and um, see presentation in the parts you want to see, um, and I'll show you how that works. In fact, see if I take you to the real form. Um, does that show the, the real form now? now? Still seeing the uh, the form entry. Is that is that what you want to see, or the results? I have two windows open, and I'm trying to go. Are you to, seeing the real form? You're in the real one. Great. Okay, I wanted to check that I'm not talking about something people aren't. So if you go to this um, form, um, and you can just go, and I up here it's tinyurl.com slash digital science, um, and you can go ahead and fill out your name um, if you give your Gmail account. And then I have some other questions for you at the bottom that we're going to come back to later so I can show you some of the advantages of using Google Forms and why I use them as a teacher. But this will also, once you fill that out, and I'll just say that one more time, http colon slash tinyurl.com slash digital science. And in fact, Mana could post that um, somewhere in the uh, WebEx forum so it's easy for people. But if you do that, um, that will take you to this form. But more importantly, um, it will give you access uh, if you go to the Google Docs, and this is kind of the real heart of how the digital science notebooks work. I'm going to take you to Google Docs here. Um, and if you go to your Google Docs screen, once you fill out this form, you might have to refresh the page um, after you fill out the form, uh, but you will see you have some new collections, and they won't be um, where they are on my screen was under my collections because they're not actually yours. Um, I just shared them with you. Um, they will be under collections shared with me. 
Um, but there will be one called Edit and one called View. Um, and under View, you can see um, this is the presentation slide deck for a Digital Science Notebooks 2. Um, you can also see of the other people who filled out the participant list. That's um, the form you just filled out. Um, and there's some other documents that I'm going to refer to later today, and now you have access to that. Um, and the way that I set that up is I, I used a very simple um, Google Apps script, and it adds you to these collections automatically. Um, but you can also, like in the classroom, you can just add your list of students. So you don't ne need to use a Google Apps script for this. But times Google Apps script can make some things easier, like during this webinar. Um, and I have a set of edit documents. And I encourage you today um, to you know, try things out as we do it. So you can create a document. Um, you can go ahead, and if you're clicked on the edit, uh, edit folder, call it Digital Science Notebook. Digital Science Google Webinar. You can go to Create New, and you can create a document, a presentation, a spreadsheet, um, any of these things, and it will actually automatically create it um, inside of this collection. Um, and we'll actually be able to interact with that, so you can see what other people are doing. So if you want to go ahead and make something like that as we're going, um, I can go back to this, and we can see what people are doing. And I think that that's that's a way to kind of add, kind of trade out as we're going through it. Um, but it's also kind of a model of how I set up my classroom. Um, I, I set up a folder for editing, and I set up a folder for viewing. Um, and that's kind of important um, because the viewing is where I can share materials with students. Um, and then the editing is a place where students can collaborate. So that's a big part of um, how, I, how I set it up um, for the classroom. Let's see here. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the slideshow here. Okay, now we're back on the slideshow. Um, it also allows you um, to, to take notes here. Some of the advantages of using collections, and I think collections are a really important um, way to organize um, your digital um, Google files for kids, um, is that it lets you share materials with students, as you saw in the view folder. Um, it can also make it easy for students to collaborate. Um, it can also um, make giving having students give each other feedback really good, and I'll talk a little bit about the comment feature. Um, students, it, it's like a binder. Um, so it has all the... Um, um, the finality of a binder, it's, it's like a bunch of pages all collected together. But unlike a binder, you can sort it however you want. So it's a very flat system um, that lets you kind of pull up the, the information you need. Um, you can use the Google search functionality. So it's a lot more powerful than a binder in a lot of ways. Um, and one of the nice things is you can actually go ahead and create folders within folders. Um, so that helps you organize it. It's kind of like putting tabs in the binder. Um, and if you folder inside of Edit, and you can try this out right now if you'd like, if you make a folder inside of Edit, it actually gets all the privileges of Edit. So anyone who's invited to Edit can see all of the folders under there. So it's a nice way to organize things, um, keep things organized. So for example, um, I'll go back to this. And I might go into Edit here. Um, and create a collection called, you know, Unit One. And we, if that was our first unit, I could go ahead and put all of our Unit One materials in there. And so that's a really easy way um, to organize the class and have access to everything. Um, and so that that's something that I do a lot in the classroom. Okay, let's go back over here. Um, so what I've been doing with collections. Um, what I'd like to do now um, that we're set up for that, um, and again, I encourage you to create some documents as kind of fun to try it out as we go. I'm going to go ahead and instead of telling you all about um, the I, um, digital science notebooks, I'm going to kind of show it through examples. Um, and so the main example I'm going to focus on first um, is a, a growth example. Um, I call it, I, I wrote an article on it called Sharing Digital Data um, in the Magazine Science and Children. But basically what I did is I took a unit on plants um, and I wanted to have them record all the information in the digital science notebooks, but I also wanted to see 
what else can digital science notebooks do that maybe traditional notebooks weren't as good at? Um, I'm going to show you some of how I did that. Um, one thing I did was um, the way I've, I've, I've done plants for a number of years, well before I, um, I did anything with digital science. Um, and often I, I use the Wisconsin fast plants, which are a set of plants that, that grow very fast, as the name suggests. Uh, and they go through their life cycle very quickly. In fact, they were developed um, by a plant pathologist who wanted to kind of have the generations of plants go through, the generations to go through more quickly. So he kind of bred them specifically to get a short life cycle. Um, and so it turned out that that was also useful in the classroom when you want them to see a lot of aspects of the life cycle in a short period of time. Um, so originally what I did was I had kids get in groups, create a controlled ex controlled experiments, like they'd experiment with one variable, such as um, in this slide you see crowding, so they could put more seeds um, in, a, in a given space than the control plant, or they, they experimented with light, or experimented with the amount of fertilizer. So they would create these small experiments, um, and they would go through the whole experimental process, growing the plants, um, collecting data, um, you know, publishing their results, sharing what they found, and go through that whole process. Um, and one of the things I realized about the digital science notebooks is a lot more, it's a lot easier to share information throughout the process. We didn't have to wait till the end when they were writing their lab report to share with the class. They could share throughout. So I had kids get into groups and come up with different ideas for experiments that they wanted to propose for the class. And so here's a group of students who wrote about um, setting up a crowding experiment. Um, and other students could just add their comments on the side. Uh, so one student wrote, um, how many fertilizer pellets will you use? How will you count the leaves on your plant? So the chance for them to kind of give feedback throughout the process. And of course, as a teacher, I use you know verbal feedback a lot in the classroom. We talk about it, but this provides another avenue for that feedback. And so they could, all you know, while they're talking about it, they can also write their comments on here, and add those comments even outside of class. So there's a lot of opportunities to kind of get involved in the process. And I thought because of, of the things I noticed was because of all this interaction. There were more thinking that went on about the experimental process. They were actually being more reflective about what made a good experiment as opposed to, you know, a not a controlled experiment when they had to share it with the class and get feedback as opposed to when they worked in the small group, there was more chance they, you know, they wouldn't put as much thought into that because it was a smaller group and there was less feedback. So I thought that's, that's a really big difference um, for the digital science notebook. Um, and the real... Um, breakthrough that I found um, with the digital science is that I found that, that I actually do the experiment as a whole class instead of small groups. And let me just explain how that worked. Um, they actually worked sort of in groups. They each, each group of students had a different um, condition for the plant. So, you know, one group was the control group and had um, it under normal conditions as it recommended um, in the, you know, when you order the plants, they have a recommended um, way to grow them. And then you know, one group changed the amount of fertilizer, one group changed how crowded the plants were, one group changed the amount of light, um, and they changed these different variables. But instead of just working in a small group, they actually used all of the data from the class to kind of compare control to these various variables. Um, and they actually entered all their information on a Google Sheet. So what you're looking at here um, is a spreadsheet, um, a Google spreadsheet, and they put each of the plants as a column. They could enter their height data um, right into this chart. Uh, and I, I set it up for them um, at first, and then I had them kind of continue to add to it. Um, and what they did was they were able to kind of look at the whole class of data in one place. And this had a number of interesting effects, I thought, on the class. One was there was a lot of kind of group responsibility. Suddenly, you know, a kid is missing the collecting their data and the whole class is kind of concerned, well, where is that data? And they, they kind of they go they go ask the kid where why they didn't fill in the data. Um so there was kind of this group accountability and and they just were even more careful about how they measure the plant because they knew that this isn't just 
just you know collecting data and writing in their notebook data that the whole class was depending on. Suddenly, there was this kind of group malady about um, collecting the data. And I think this is important, particularly in science. There's so many large group experiments now. There's so much large-scale collaboration. This was a chance for students to kind of feel that um, in the classroom level. And I thought that, that was a great opportunity for them. Um, and you know, data chart doesn't always get all the information information you want. So they, I actually had them create Google Docs as well, um, where they could record more of their anecdotal data. Um, they could take pictures and put it right in there. You can get kind of all the media choices right there um, in Google Doc. And this, again, was shared as well. So students could go back and look at all this data and say, you know, I don't, your measurement looks a little off. Let me go look at the pictures of the plant and compare that. So there's a lot of this kind of thinking about what accuracy means, thinking about what the experiment means, uh, and a lot of opportunity for them to kind of go back and check in ways that just weren't possible um, before it was digitized because you didn't have photos of everything. You didn't have the whole class's data in one place. Um, and it wasn't so accessible. You had to kind of find people's notebooks and look for the right day. Um, so I just saw a lot of benefits coming from setting it up like this. Um, and, you know, I would, in the mornings, they would they would record the heights of their plants every morning. Um, I'm actually a science specialist, um, so I didn't I wasn't with them every morning, but a homeroom teacher would help me out with this. And, in fact, one teacher said, you know, well, it's kind of hard to get um, all computers out. So I had them just write on a little slip of paper all the numbers, and then they could enter it at any time. In fact, they could just stick that right in their homework folder, and they could enter that data at night or whenever they wanted to because the, the sheet was accessible from anywhere. Um, here, this is later in the experiment. At the What's great, one of the things I love about this experiment is it goes through the whole life cycle. So the essentially um, dies at the end, um, and it creates the seed pods, which you see here. Um, and then they have to go ahead and count the seeds um, and see you know, how, how, what reproductive success they had. Um, and her, um, you know, it was, it was kind of cool because they could not only collect uh, like the height of the plant, but there was a lot of other data that they could collect and put on that spreadsheet, like how many seeds did it produce, how many pods were there, how many leaves were there. Um, they even recorded things about the timing of events, like when did the flowers open, and all the various data. Um, and because the data was all kind of recorded in a uniform format on that chart, they were able to kind of really compare across the class and see what was going on there. Um, let me show you um, just a few examples of how this would work in a Google Sheet. Um, let me go back to our browser here. And one of the documents that you'll see um, in the View um, folder is the example data chart. Um, and so I just made an example um, of a data chart here um, for you. That. Um, and we can do a few things here. Um, I just want to show you. And you can go ahead and create your own spreadsheet, uh, try some of these things out uh, as we're doing it. Um, one of the things that I did that I I had them collect all on the common data sheet so they could easily see what was going on um, with each other's experiments. They were really exposed to this idea of of cleaning data. And I think this is something that sometimes gets overlooked in schools is that data often um, isn't clean. It's not it's not like in the form that you need it. Like some kids one might have written, you know, five and wrote inches. I mean I mean, technically, they should have written five centimeters because we're measuring everything metric, but might not have put it in a number format. And later, you'll see if you want to do any math on this, it's really important that these be numbers and you don't put in characters in there because you can't like add it up or average or anything like that. But this, this really started to understand that you know data isn't always the way you need it right away. Like you know, a student would write dead. Air. And then, like, what does that mean? And they, they could go, but one of the great things is they could go back and go to that student and look at their notes and talk to them and kind of figure that out and come to some agreement as a class about what should really be written there. Um, the other big issue that came up was what if somebody didn't fill out the data chart? And there's actually 
um, some cool features um, in Google Spreadsheets. You can actually, I'm going to go ahead and select these cells here. Um, and I'm going to go to format. There's something called conditional formatting. Um, and you can say, you know, you can do a lot of different things. When I say, if the cell is empty, I'm going to make the background red. Um, and I'm just going to click Save Rules. And there's a lot of different things you can do with this, but you can make it so that immediately it's apparent if you forgot to fill in your data. Um, and that's kind of cool. It, it lets it shows you there. And then if, you know, if the kid, say it's 9-9, um, nine, nine, and the kid says, oh, well, I'm going to go back and measure it, and it turns out it's five centimeters, then it goes away and it's not red anymore. Um, and then you can have a whole discussion all about, well, can you go back and fill in 9-7? Because what's 9-9? Can you actually know what height was on 9-7? And so all these issues about validity of data and and what counts and what's, what's fair um, in an experiment came up because there are all these opportunities to kind of discuss each other's data. Data. Uh, sometimes these things get lost in the process when you're working in small groups, but as the whole group, there were a lot of opportunities to kind of have these discussions. Um, and you could do a lot. Um, I'm going to go up here. Say I want to know the average height of these four plants. Um, you can go at an insert. If you go to the insert column, you can insert um, average. Um, I just have to select the cells that are being averaged. I'm going to select um, B3 through E3. It gives me that average of those cells, and I can copy that. I hit Command C, but I can also do it this way: copy, um, and I can go to these cells, and I can paste it in, and then that'll give me the average for each of the days, so I can kind of get a sense of what the trends are. And this is really useful, especially if you have one um, tab is the control plants. So you can average those, and then you could have another tab that has all the experimental plants for a given variable and average all those. And then that gives you kind of a quick look on uh, what's going on there. Um, and so they had a lot more experience with kind of manipulating the data and kind of thinking about what would do with data and what are useful things to do with data. Um, that what, really what grade level is this for? This is for fifth grade. Fifth grade, great. Yep, this is a fifth grade class. And, you know, these these are students who were the um, range of skills in the class, but they really um, they were able to kind of absorb all these, what I consider pretty advanced kind of thinking because of, I think, largely because of the technology, they were able to access things that would be much harder to access if you, if you didn't have the technology. Like they could kind of visualize and experience things more readily. Um, than they could without the technology. I'm going to go back um, to the presentation here, and I'm going to show you another thing that's a big part of the experimental process um, is um, you know, showing your results at the end. So you take those averages that I was showing you how to do the averages before. You can go ahead and kind of create a graph um, showing everything that you found from it. So this this is an example of a graph that a student created. Um, they put in a little caption here, and this is kind of the whole analysis piece of experiments. So it's really important kind of thinking about how do you show what you found, how do you communicate it. Um, and one of the things that was great was they were taking data not just from a group of four students collecting data, they were collecting from you know a group of 20 students the the whole class and they could take all that data, aggregate it, and you know graphs of it and see how it compared. And in fact, I teach four sections of fifth grade, so they could go into other sections and see what their data looked like and make you know all these comparisons and really kind of think about it more deeply. Um, and in fact, I want to show you a little bit about the graphing because I think this is another really important piece of the scientific process. I think data is sometimes under uh, taught um, in the science classroom what to do with data and how to analyze it and how to show it. I want to show you really quick um, some of the things you can do here. I'm going to take, say you take this plant data, so I'm on the example data chart again. I'm going to go in and I'm going to collect all of this data, not the average data, but the um, the raw data that I collected here, height of plant um, um, for the three days. Um, and you can go right here to insert, and I'm going to insert a chart. And if you to insert chart, 
um, you could go ahead and make kind of any chart you want. Um, this is really an important um, piece, I think. I'm going to go in and make a, make a line chart. Let's see how that comes out. Um, this is a really important piece about um, doing online or doing it digitally. Because, in the, you know, before the digital um, version of this, it worked to kind of make the graph. There wasn't a lot of chance to talk about, well, what's the right graph for this? What's the best way to represent the data? Now kids can kind of see the data in different forms. They can see a pie chart of it. They can see um, a, line, a line chart of it. Here, let's see what it would look like in a pie chart. So it doesn't even match a pie chart. You can see it as a bar graph. So you can think about different ways to represent the data and which you know, representation makes the most sense and is the most logical um, for that. And in fact, I'm going to go, I think I can do a better job um, to actually select those as well. As you see in this one, I have A1 through E5. Um, if I insert the graph here, uh, it show labels as well. Um, and so let's see chart. And so you can actually get it'll it'll put in the colored labels, it'll put the dates on the bottom, uh, and you can control that stuff. It actually has this bar here that's pretty important to customize. Um, you can you can set the horizontal axis, you can set the vertical axis. So say I want to call the vertical axis height. Go ahead um, and set that, and all the horizontal axis like A or whatever. Um, and so you have some chance to really format it the way you want. But I think it's really important how kids can you know, make choices about graphs, go back and make new choices. They can give each other feedback about this process. So there's a lot of opportunities um, for kids kind of think about the whole process of representing data and what's the best way to make your argument. Um, they, they have more opportunities to kind of get more repetition and iterations into thinking about that than you would with a paper science notebook without, without the kind of these quick tools um, that allow you to think about it. So I think if you use it right, you can really make the process deep and get them thinking about it um, in a powerful way. Um, let's go back over here. So I have a couple of slides on making the graphs. So, um, so I think the Google Sheets were big, were big addition to my class. They not only um, allowed better um, organizing of data than I was able to do with a paper notebook, but they created all of this kind of collaborative thinking and collaborative work um, that just wasn't possible before. Um, another um, aspect of Google Docs that I used a lot um, in teaching that I want to show you a little bit was Google Presentation. Um, and Google presentation was really helpful. Um, you know, I before uh, going to the digital notebooks, I did a lot with kind of um, you know presentations on a pro with a projector and showing you know maybe a PowerPoint or when Google came out with the Google presentation, you could do Google presentation and it's easier to store it. But it really changes um, what's possible in the classroom, partly um, because the presentation is so accessible. Uh, so I had this um, presentation. Here, one on motion um, could show it to the class and use it kind of as talking points to to kind of reinforce concepts. But it's also something students could access outside of school. So if they were studying for something, they could look back at it. Um, sometimes I used um, Google presentations as a set of directions. So it's a set of instructions that they need for the class. Um, I could go over it with the whole class in the front. But then they could go access that later. So, in, so if somebody said, well, can you explain that whole thing to me? And I'll say, go, why don't you go watch the presentation one more time? So they can get that rep. Some students need that extra repetition. And this kind of builds it right into it. So I found that really helpful. Um, I did some work. Um, I did that with student sharing. Um, using the presentation. They love to make presentations um, and organize their work using a presentation. Um, and one of the things that was great about it here, in fact, I'll show you this presentation. Um, this is from an ex a student um, did this presentation. Um, this is on, I actually used um, CHET. I'm out of the University of Colorado um, in Boulder. 
um, made a whole set of kind of little tools um, for um, a lot of, I mean, it's it's a lot of areas of science, but I was interested in motion for this particular unit. Um, and they had a digital kind of pendulum as a, you know, a simulation of a pendulum. Um, and, you know, I like to do a lot of work with real pendulums, um, you know, moving them and having them kind of show them. But what I liked about this was I could have them do a little experiment um, on their own, and I could assess, you know, what their, what their skill level was at inquiry on an individual level, because I kind of wanted to see, you know, they, they work well, they're they working well in groups, but what can they do when they're kind of trying to figure it out by themselves? So this was, digital made it a little bit easier for them to work um, independently. And this person created a presentation, um, shared it with the class. Um, but one of the great things is it's you don't get into this whole mess of, you know, getting the the presentation on the board at the front or on on the computer that, that's connected to the printer. You access to it from anywhere um, very easily. You can also kind of change the whole presentation style. Like sometimes I would have, you know, kids just show the, the presentation to a few kids, um, or maybe kids would have to look at each other's presentation and give three pieces of feedback, and then we'd use class time for a discussion. So you could you could use a lot of kind of iterations of this flipped classroom of you know kids are looking at the work outside and you you can utilize that classroom time really effectively. Um, so did a lot um, with presentations. You can see I'm not going to go through their whole uh, presentation, but you can see they used um, pictures and they could kind of kind of control text. They put in a chart in here um, and they kind of write out what their thinking was. So it's a really nice way for them to kind of formalize their thoughts. But again, unlike, you know, the digital gives you a few more options, how to present and how to share. And it, it gives you ways to kind of just make the learning that much more effective because you can choose just the right the, the right um, approach for the situation, um, being your judgment as a teacher. Let me go back to the present in here. Um, I talked a little bit about how having directions or tutorials for students. I also, um, one of the nice things I'll show you in a little bit on Google Sites, it's really easy to embed video. Um, and my students really got into the, uh, making videos for tutorials. So I could give them a little tutorial on what to do in the lab by video, but they could create tutorials by video. Um, and sometimes they would create tutorials for the next year, or they would, you know, one student would be responsible for creating a certain tutorial. And they get really excited by video, actually. Um, and, it, you know, for students, it really allows them to show their understanding and that it was it was harder for them to do with just the straight writing. Um, another thing um, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about um, is Google Forms, um, which is which is really an extension um, of spreadsheet. Um, in fact, today you filled out a Google Form um, to get access to the docs. In fact, let's see here. Let's see if anyone has created anything in our docs folder here. Let's see, go to here. I don't see anything in here. I don't think I don't know if anyone's created anything in here yet. Um, let's see. One thing we could do is check if you go into the folder um, and you go share. You can actually see who's sharing this folder. So we can see there are a number of people who've added themselves. So you'll see all of these people added to the folder. Um, but I'm going to see. If, I'm, I'm encouraging you to just add stuff because then that'll kind of give a sense that. Okay. To clarify, filling out the form won't add anything to the folder. It will just make it appear on people's Google Docs list? Yeah, it'll just mean you're on this list here. So actually, um, on the shared settings. So you so your can see name it. on there, you should be able to see that collection in your Google Docs list, and you can be able to create something new using that Create New button if you're collecting that collection, or you can drag something into that collection if you want to. Exactly. So you can go and create new right here, or if you already have something, here if I go here, if I wanted to take example data chart and go and drag it into this collection like that. Now it's already in the collection, so I'm not going to drag it right now, but you can kind of add stuff um, to collections. Um, 
um, and so I wanted to reinforce that just to make sure people knew. It looks like some people may not have um, access to the folder, even though they filled out the form. So I don't know, maybe that's an issue with different Google Apps accounts or Gmail accounts. But uh, have you ever experienced that? It seems like a couple of people have filled out the form and don't have access yet. They might have to refresh the page. Um, sometimes if, if it's in a different window, you just have to hit like this refresh button here. But should everyone who's on this list have access to it? And it looks like, I mean, it's definitely not everybody, but there are some people on here. It's something we can look into. Um, but I should be able to get some access to that. But let's talk a little bit. Let's move on to forms here. Um, so there's a lot you can do with forms. In fact, let's look at um, some examples of the things you can do with forms. So forms are kind of like what you filled out today. It's a set of questions. Um, I sometimes you to just do a quick quiz or to get some information about the students, like what um, you know what they understand about something. You can make it multiple choice. You can have fill in the blank. Um, it's so possible to get more complicated with it um, and have the forms correct them, you know, correct automatically, send feedback to students automatically, um, and that involves what I talked about before the Google Apps script, um, which I'm going to get to go into a lot of detail today, um, just because of time. But I know I saw um, some other Google webinars um, that address. Google Apps Script in more detail. Now, that's something I would recommend once you get more into it, because there's a lot you can do with that. Um, one of the things that I sometimes do is, you know, there's something called an exit card. Um, you can, and you, you just want to quickly get a sense, like here I wrote, what it was the main idea of today's lesson? Um, and I sometimes I really like the kind of Twitter-esque format of um, kind of keeping your point size. So I sometimes say you have to do it in 140 characters um, or whatever. The you know try to keep their their point really um, focused. Um, and then I'll sometimes put in a multiple choice um, question to kind of get a sense of what they're understanding. So that's a great way to use it. Um, I really like to use exit cards. I have done some of just collecting information about the students. We went on a trip. Um, we did a sleepover in fifth grade um, to a forest, and we wanted to find out kind of what we wanted to have some choice activities. We wanted to find out about, you know, making bunk assignments, all of that, all the kind of stuff. Um, I think form is a great way to collect information. It's a way you can um, collect data. So you could have, you know, students collect you know, if they're doing a scientific study that involves, you know, data about each other, they can collect the data that way. Um, they can use the form to collect data from the whole school. So there's a lot they can do with the form. Why don't I go ahead and just show you the form that you filled out today, because that's kind of interesting. Um, here is the form that you filled out today, and you actually have it in your folder, so you can look at it as well. Um, you'll see these are all the people who filled it out. Um, and so what happens is when you fill out the form, it fills in one of the rows in this in this spreadsheet. So each time somebody fills out the form, it fills out the row, um, and that gives you know. Then we ha I have all the emails in there. Now the the Google script actually goes in and takes that email and then adds it to the folder automatically. Um, but there's some other things you can do without Google Apps Script, like you can just collect you know, this information. Like you can find out, you know, what answers people gave. Um, you can even use the conditional formatting piece that I showed you before. If you could type in, you know, is it equal to, and if, if you type in the correct answer in there, then you can make it coded by who got things right and wrong. Um, so that can kind of be a nice way to check things as a teacher. Um, it also has this feature called summary of responses. Um, and if you click on that, is that is that showing up as well? The, yes. Yes, okay, we are excellent. seeing the summary. You can see here. We can see, you know, role as educator. We can get a sense of what kind of people are here today. Um, and this is kind of a really cool. I really like this feature um, of the form because it gives you a snapshot um, of what where people, you know, what grades people are working with. 
um, when people are filling it out and kind of how many years experience that that it didn't kind of aggregate in a numerical way, but it gives you kind of a sense of the range of the responses. Um, and so you get kind of a picture of that looking at the form there. Um, and so I think that's that's a useful uh, tool to use. Um, and I use it for a lot of different things, um, you know, from, you know, in the classroom to kind of collect information. Um, and it's it's a nice, it's especially useful to get quick information um, that you want to award um, and can use for assessment later. Um, so I, re I really like that. And in fact, you go ahead and kind of try this out. Um, here, let's see here. If I go back to the docs list, you can go and you can you can go and create a form. Here, if you go here and create form, it's under create new. If you're if you've already selected the edit folder that I shared with you, um, you can actually just go ahead, click the form here, uh, and then you can come up with a title for it. You know, you could call it quiz. Say, and then you can come up with different questions. Um, and you'll see here uh, that there's options to make different kinds of questions. So you can make a text question, um, which you saw one of. You can make uh, multiple choice. You can have check boxes, which allows um, a user to add, check multiple um, choices. Like I made that an option for um, the grade level you work with, because some people could work with a wide range of grades. Um, you choose from a list, so it's a little um, scroll-down menu that you can choose from. So there's a lot of different types of questions that you can make here. Um, and that, that's a really, I think, um, powerful tool in the classroom, and I use that a fair amount um, you know, to the extent that I can, I can get in full data on the kids. And, and I have kids use it as well um, to kind of collect data. So let me go back to the presentation here. Um, last piece that I want to talk about um, today is Google Sites. Um, I think Google Sites is another powerful. This is this is outside of Google Docs. It's its own. Um, it's its own tab at the top. Um, if when, when within Google you can click on Sites, um, and creating sites is a, a great way for students to kind of put together everything they've been working on. Um, so one of the things that I do a lot of um, is I, I use it to have them organize um, information so they can create a site um, and organize their docs, make links to docs, put various um, pieces in there. Um, I, I always make a class site to help organize information for the students so they know where to go to to get their homework information. Um, they can it's it's kind of an easy way to create links so students can get to the docs they need, uh, especially if you're using them as a resource uh, that you're sharing with them. Um, it also is a good way for the, to kind of organize the experiments the students are doing. You can make links to the docs. Um, and I can show you um, the set that I'm using um, with fifth grade this year. Um, I'll look that up in a minute. Um, you, it's also a wonderful way to uh, share student work with families because um, the site kind of makes a nice layout for it. Um, I would encourage families to log in with their kid um, because the, to get access to the site, um, you can. The best way I find is for for the kids to access. And the, the the parents just log in with the kid, um, but you know if you have a different situation, you want parents to have separate access. You can also invite um, their email addresses as well to make it. Um, and in fact, we're doing a lot with e-portfolios at my school, and we're finding the sites is a good way to kind of organize that. In fact, it has um, something called an announcements page that allows you to make a very simple blog, um, and it, it again it gives you a lot of nice. Um, pieces around video. Um, and in fact, in the plants unit, um, we did a project where I asked students to um, show what they understood about pollination. Um, for this, they used, um, you know, they used, I think they used Keynote for it um, to create a video. And I'll just show you a quick example. Um, but there's a lot of different tools out there to create video, and Sites makes it easy to kind of post this, you know, embed the video on your site, um, and you can use embed code and all of that. 
Um, and it, it gives it, students really feel like they can express their full range of creativity. So I'm going to just show you this really, really quick. Um, for some reason, it, this is posted um, on our school server. Um, and for some reason, it's not allowed to make it full screen. But I'll just play it. Hopefully, you'll be able to see it in this. Uh, Okay, I think there was a little bit of feedback on that. I think there was a little bit. Here. Oh, there we go. Um, but the idea is that, you know, the student was able to kind of show. I was excited about a lot of students got really excited about this project because they were, you know, the, the assignment was um, to, to kind of show what they knew about pollination. We talked a lot um, in the ask plant experiment, actually, a piece of it is they actually have to pollinate the plants because that's, that's how you create the seed pods. Um, and so we use that to kind of talk about, well, what's involved in pollination and what are the steps and what what's the importance of it. Um, and they're able to sh kind of show their learning in a new, different way using digital tools. Um, and Google Google Sites made it easy to kind of post that, for them to share it with each other, for them to share it with their families, and to kind of give each other feedback. Um, so I really like uh, all the different kind of media that I can use um, using Using the in Google Sites and using the Google platform. Let's see. Um, and another thing that's nice about Google Sites is it allows um, it has its own comment feature. So within that blogging piece um, that I spoke about, there's also um, an automatic comment feature that you can utilize, um, and students can give each other um, feedback um, on their work. And that. That allows for, we you know we had a lot of conversation around what is good feedback and what kind of a feedback is appropriate, what kind of feedback is useful, um, how do you use, you know, how does digital feedback compare to verbal feedback and what, you know, what, how are the rules different, how is it, you know, how does it work differently. Um, and I think it's good for kids to get a lot of um, chances to kind of explore that, um, really think about that because I think, you know, we see kids going into the digital world um, and not always being equipped to handle it well, um, you know, making inappropriate posts um, on sites and various things. And I think by giving them opportunities to experiment with that um, in the classroom, they're more likely to kind of figure out what the right choices are. Um, and, you know, it, it also relates very closely to science. I think a lot of science um, it, in the professional world is happening around, you know, digital partnerships and, and digital collaboration. And we need kids to get access to that. We need to have some experiences, um, you know, opportunities to try that out um, and figure out how that works and get familiar with the tools that they need so that they can use them effectively. Because you don't, you don't learn a tool by using it once. You have to get experience using it and trying it. And, and making mistakes with it. And then when you really, you know, learn how to use it and learn how to use it effectively. Um, I know the, the kids that I have in fifth grade, they're just in, digitally, they're in a very different place than kids were 10 years ago or, you know, 20 years ago. They have a sense of the tools. They, you know, they know what a Google Doc is. They think about, you know, crowdsourcing solutions to problems. You know, one... One of my fifth, fifth graders wanted to, um, you know, have have a party, and their first thought was, "Well, I can use an evite to figure out who's who's going to come to that party, um, you know, use the check boxes to figure out who's going to come." So they're really kind of starting to internalize these digital tools and, and make them part of their lives. And I think, you know, this is something we should embrace as schools, so we can really, have, you know, utilize this and utilize these digital tools to really. Um, you know, help them with their learning. Um, and I think that's that's just a powerful, um, you know, approach that we have available to us now. Um, and the last thing is I was just going to talk 
um, briefly about Google Apps Script. Um, one thing I would recommend that, that I use a lot, lot with my students is um, Mail Merge. And in fact, if you go, um, I'm not going to go over it in detail here, um, but if you go to the Google Apps Script page, there's a tutorial on making a Mail Merge. Um, and that's a really useful tool. Essentially what it does is it can take the list of email addresses that, uh, like the one that you just filled out today, uh, and it can go through that list um, and send an email to each person on that list. And that can be really useful um, in, in classroom setting when you want to give you know, individual feedback, like you can send an email with you to each kid about you know, some piece of feedback, um, something related to the form they fill out, um, and you can automate it so that as soon as they fill out, you know, you can have a little exit card with five questions, and it can automatically let them know how they did that um, kind of work. Um, and here is, I just wanted to show you, this how simple the script is that I use to add you to the folder. And I'm sorry that for some people it wasn't working so well. Um, but essentially, it's just a short function that just, um, it's folder.addEditor. Um, this simple function allows it to actually, there's two lines here at the bottom. You folder dot add editor, that adds you to the editor folder, um, and then the edit folder, and then this folder, folder two, which I set to view, that should add you to the add viewer. Um, that should add you to this folder. So the simple piece of code simplified things for me. Um, it made it so that I don't have to go in and cut and paste your email addresses and put them into those folders while I'm trying to present to you. But you can also imagine in the classroom that little scripts like this um, can make some things easier and save you time as a teacher. Um, so I, I do I do appreciate the, the Google Apps script um, for some of those things. And um, last thing I wanted to say um, was that I think one of the powerful things about um, doing digital science notebook is I found it. I, I like there's been able to use it to really promote inquiry in my class, and that's really important to me. That it's just you know a tool that used to to show off the tool and you know an end in itself. That it actually helps to get a skill that I was interested in before I even started using the digital science notebooks. And um, this is a list of some of the um, inquiry skills as listed um, in the National Science Education Standards. Um, but I feel like these these are the things that, um, you know, the digital notebooks are helping me get, you know, more focus on, you know, more of a focus on concepts um, as we saw. And they can, they can represent their ideas through video. They can count on each other ideas. They can give each other feedback. Um, they can think about you know, we it talks about an appreciation of how we know. As students got deeper into the experimental process, they could kind of be more reflective about what experiments are. What is the connection between experiments and the knowledge that we're gaining in science? Um, and I think that really builds the third point, this understanding of the nature of science, of how the scientific process works. You know, in this plant experiment that I did with the students, they, they thought in many ways more deeply about that process of science and all of the challenges and all of the, the complexity of it became a little bit more apparent to them because they were able to work with a larger scale experiment to see some of the things that can go wrong, to see you know, what happens when you have more data. Um, and, you know, they, they gained some skills about experimenting. Um, you know, and of course you can do a lot of this without the digital science notebook. You, you know, I did it with small groups, but I think the by, by changing the format, I was able to get you know review more students. I was able to kind of format the class in a way that was more accessible to some students, and so I think it gives us some advantages um, in terms of how we approach it, and it makes some things easier. You know, I, I always strive to make a learner-centered environment. I always strive to make the student experiments um, drive the inquiry of the class and drive the discussion of the class. But so these tools just made it a little bit easier for me so that I, I could do that um, with less work and more more of the work kind of fell on the students kind of organizing. And I think that's that's an important move in education is making kind of the whole process more natural and more fluid um, and just make make it easier to happen so that a learner in a 
classroom can become the norm and something that we can all do um, in our class. So that's that's kind of what I want to leave you with. Um, and this this will be posted um, on the Dana's write up all the notes. But if you want to go ahead and fill out um, an evaluation now, you can do it. There's a, an address here you can use. But again, you can also wait for the email um, and do that later as well. Yep, it seems like there was just a, a slight technical difficulty for some of you filled out the form. You might find that collection under your all items, or if you do a search in your docs list, you might find it instead of in your my collections or my collections shared with me, but it, it probably is still there. Just uh, not exactly sure how it happened, but I'm sure it'll, it'll correct itself soon. So thank you again, Greg. If there are any other last-minute questions, feel free to type them in the chat box or in the um, Q&A box. There's a, a question on the name of that folder again, Greg. Okay, let's go in. Let's go right over to this here. And I'm sorry about that. That it didn't. Uh, the, one of the challenges of um, preparing this is that when I add it, and here you can see it here. I'll move this over so you can see it. It's got space dash space digital science Google webinar. Other one is view space dash space digital science Google webinar. Um, one of the challenges is that for me it comes up in my collections. Um, if it was supposed to come up in collections shared with me, uh, it's like instead it came up, you know, when you go to home, it was just somewhere in this list, which is harder to find. Um, but in any doc, you can always go in and search for it. Um, and so, you know, if you type in edit, if it comes up here, you'll see maybe it'll come up like that. And you can click on that folder, and then you'll see everything in it. Um, sorry it wasn't as uh, seamless as I had hoped. Well, thank you, Greg. Um, we actually have run out of time, but thank you, everybody, for joining us. Greg did allude to Google Apps Scripts, and we're going to be doing um, three webinars, actually, this month. The remainder of this month, every week, we'll do a webinar uh, focusing on different parts of Google Apps Scripts. So next week we're doing a tutorial where we'll walk through some of those tutorials that Greg talked about, like mail merge and adding things to calendar. The following week on the 21st, we'll be doing one on automating school processes with Google Apps. So we'll just walk through a few examples of other scripts that schools have created. And finally, on the 26th, Monday the 26th, we're also doing a webinar that's a basic introduction to the JavaScript that you would need to start doing some very basic Google Apps scripts from programming. So if you're to programming or you want to start playing around with Google Apps scripts but aren't quite sure how to use JavaScript, that would be a good introduction for you. And they'll, um, Rachel and uh, Wendy will be certified trainers walking through the basics of programming so that you can get started with your own Google Apps scripts. And Greg shared a great one here today. So um, Google Scripts for the rest of September will be some, some good webinars that we'll have for you. And again, I'll send you the link to this recorded webinar as well as Greg's slides um, and uh, links to some of the upcoming webinars in case you're interested in registering. So thank you, Greg. Thanks, Dana.